Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. What makes a good society? How should it be governed and who should be allowed to live in it? What are politics for and are we naturally political animals? These are old questions. Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Thomas Aquinas and Nicola Machiavelli are just a few who've asked them. But they all have one thing in common, and that's a book by the Greek philosopher Aristotle. It's called Politics, a a two-and-a-half-thousand-year-old collection of notes that have cast a long shadow in political philosophy. In the politics, Aristotle tried to establish why human beings live together and how best they should do so. With me to discuss Aristotle's ideas and his influence are Paul Cartledge, A.G. Leventis Professor of Greek Culture at the University of Cambridge, Angie Hobbs, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Warwick University, and Annabel Brett, Senior Lecturer in History at the University of Cambridge. Angie Hobbs, the first thing Aristotle tries to establish is why human beings live together at all. Can you explain his answer? Yes, he says that man is naturally a political animal. And by that, he doesn't mean um, that we are geared by nature to go around putting political leaflets through uh, doors. He means that if we're going to flourish, if we're going to prosper, we need to actualise our naturally and distinctively human uh, faculties, particularly our intellectual and moral faculties. But especially our moral faculties cannot be actualised outside the social context of a polis. So when he says that man, and the Greek word in fact means human, humans are naturally political animals, he means that we're the kind of animal naturally designed to live together in a polis, in a, in a community. A and that's community. Exactly, yeah. mm-hmm. in, a, in a city-state. Um, and that's the context in which we can flourish. So the polis is there, is engineered to enable us to flourish. This classification is part of his method, isn't it? Can you elaborate that a little bit, the Aristotelian method of of classifying species, classifying thoughts, classifying ideas? We were classified... our species as as political because we fitted into this particular stratum. That's right. Aristotle trained as a biologist and and pre-Darwin he believes that species are sort of eternally fixed and have uh, propensities and faculties that need to be actualised and excelised for all eternity. And yes, that he tries to discover what the human animal is like, what what we can do, what we need to do, what's going to enable us exactly. But the interesting thing, really, is why he thinks we are naturally inclined. He brings in the idea of nature. Can you elaborate on that? That we naturally, we as this particular species, naturally go towards a polis state. We need to. Do, we go to that. I've said enough. After you. Yes. Well, he, he's entering a debate which was set up um, the, the previous century by some uh, travelling philosophers called sophists, and. Sophists such as Antiphon said that there was a, a big distinction between nature and culture, as they termed it, between nature or phusis and culture, convention, law or nomos. And according to Antiphon, uh, he says that um, humans are best served if we follow nature and not culture, that societies and conventions and laws are artificial, they're shackles, they're, they're kind of pin us down, they're fetters, and what we need to do is break free from all this and live according to nature. Aristotle enters into this debate and says, no, 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 they've got it all wrong. There isn't this big divide between nature and culture. We are naturally designed to live in cultures, and they this this uh, dichotomy is a false one. So was this argument going on? Can we imagine it going on in, as it were, the, in, in Athens at the time, in the schools, in the streets? Oh, we oh we know, yes. I mean, our, our Aristotle is following Plato, who also picks up from Protagoras and Antiphon and other sophists. Uh, absolutely, yes. And Aristotle says, look, look at what a polis, a city-state is. He says, look at its origins. It has two natural origins, two natural pairs of human association. One is the, the pair between male and female for the... Uh, purpose of procreation. The other is the pair between uh, master and slave for the purposes of mutual preservation. 
the, the polis uh, stems out of these two natural associations which start off, they form a household, households group together and spin off and form villages, villages eventually group together and form the polis. So the polis, says Aristotle, is the natural end of these two early and natural associations. And, and nature, says Aristotle, is itself an end. So for all these reasons, the polis, the city-state, is a natural organism. He almost talks of it as if it's a living being. And we're operating in a city-state environment. There are about a 1,000 city-states at the time. The Greek Empire is going from present-day Georgia over to Spain, and so that is his model time and again. He thinks about 100,000 people is the limit, doesn't he, of how this thing can operate properly. Paul Cutledge, what about Aristotle's own experiences of cities? And I've, I've mentioned um, the spread of cities, the spread of the Greek Empire, the number of city-states, the differences between them and so on. Uh, and he, 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 he himself was uh, brought up in a city-state um, until he was 17, not Athens. Yeah, there's a paradox about uh, Aristotle because he spent most of his adult life in Athens and he could not, I think, have achieved what he did had he not. On the other hand, he never became a citizen of Athens and, a, as I say, since the work is fundamentally about citizenship and he calls it a city-state, I sometimes think citizen-state would be a better word because though there is a state, there is a formal set of rules, what matters for Aristotle is who is to actually make the decisions, who's to share on an equal basis, and he decides it's citizens. But to go back to himself personally, he, he comes from northern Greece, from a place called Stagaira or Stagairos, and so in the Renaissance he was referred to, you know, we all know Aristotle, the Stagirite. So if you come across that, hot Stagirites is the citizen of Stagara, and he never lost that. You don't get deprived of your citizenship unless you do something terrible, even if you leave your city. So he becomes a metic, which means a, somebody who changes their residence, and he becomes a resident alien in Athens. His own home city, while he was in Athens, was actually physically destroyed and thereby hangs quite a big tale, because Aristotle's uh, dad was a doctor, and as Angie says, he, he learns his, his first sort of training is in zoology and biology. But his dad was doctor, not for a Greek, or not for a, um, a city-state, but for a king, king of Macedon. So Aristotle comes with a bit of baggage because in his adult lifetime, Macedon and Athens are destined to fight each other, and of course Macedon wins. And Aristotle is a sort of ambiguous figure in Athens' terms because he's linked to this uh, Macedonian background. So that probably is enough to, to set us on the way. We've missed a rather big name in that, which is a name Alexander the Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to prompt you on this, Paul. <laughs> no, this is a very fair point, but I mean, it is a secondary point. That's to say, Aristotle was um, quite well established by the time that um, his... Uh, it's not actually Aristotle's father's employer, but um, a son of that king of Macedon, namely Philip of Macedon, who is also the father of Alexander the Great. Philip hired Aristotle to come up north to spend a year or so simply teaching mainly Ar Alexander, of course, but also some mates of his. So it's a very formative period. Aristotle is uh, in his... He's about 40, and Alexander's about 13, so there's a sort of mentor relationship, which lasts throughout. I mean, we can perhaps come back to what uh, Aristotle thought about Alexander <laughs> and what Alexander thought about Aristotle later on. But um, you're absolutely right that for a crucial period in Alexander's formative years, Aristotle was his teacher. So and, of course, as Alexander took the idea, as we're told, with well, books and scholars, we'll come yeah, back to that. Absolutely, say that. But, absolutely. But, 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 but we're, we're talking ab about a man who runs... What, we use the Latin word lyceum there at school. Yeah. And he, ru he runs it in a way that uh, he has, as I understand, 158 uh, city-states are researched by yeah. scholars, let us call them, students who work with him. And from that he draws his conclusions. So he's got a research base Absolutely from the right. city-states, 158 out of about 1,000. Um, mm. uh, and one of that must be Sparta, which is quite is. important, although he's rather worried about it. Can we well, use Sparta in the context of what he's getting from this, uh, this research examination? We certainly can. I mean, he's based in Athens, and Athens and Sparta have a very sort of uh, difficult relationship. Um, believe it 
or not, they were actually allied briefly in the uh, fourth century because they have mutual enemies, one of whom is Macedon and another of whom is Thebes. But um, Sparta had been, it's thought, the origin of, in a way, reflection on politics, political arrangements of what we now call a utopian nature. In other words... For some non-Spartans, Sparta was a kind of ideal city, one that you possibly want to model yourself on or at any rate uh, be inspired by and possibly introduce um, <clears throat> what would tend to be quite radically um, um, radically uh, revolutionary almost uh, reforms in your own city. So if you're going to do 158, which is, as you say, roughly about a sixth, you're bound to do Sparta. And actually Sparta's pretty much bound to be one of your first. So he might even have sent out more than one of his pupils, several pupils. Unfortunately, the work that they produced doesn't survive as such. What we have are quotations in later sources such as Plutarch. And, of course, wouldn't it just be um, history's fate that the one of the 158 that does survive is the one about which we, in a way, know most in other ways, I, I, Athens, you know, if only Sparta had survived or Thebes had survived. But I should just add that there is at least one non-Greek city among the ones that um, Aristotle researched in this way, and that's Carthage. Um, we don't want to go there, but it's fun that he thought of uh, Carthage as a kind of city-state. Annabel Brett, we, can we use Sparta, though, to talk about some of the... Um, when we're talking about the constitution of this mm -hmm. ideal city and its yeah. politics, because uh, the things that he liked about Sparta and things that he really did not like... Let's start with women. Uh, that, th that he didn't like the, the way that the Spartans treated women because his views of women would... Can you just go into that? Um, yes, well, I think that um, he felt, along with other contemporaries, that uh, Spartan women had too much uh, licence and, and therefore sort of power within, within the city-state. And uh, Aristotle felt that women... Um, well, his, his position on women is, is, is quite nuanced, in, in fact. I mean, as he begins to set it up in Politics 1, he, he, he sees uh, the pairing between man and wife as some kind of pre-political form of association. And there is a kind of reading of Aristotle's politics which suggests that the household is a kind of apolitical sphere or, or pre-political but actually, if you read um, Book One carefully, it becomes clear that the position of women, they do have a political role in, in Aristotle's politics. He says, for example, that both women and children should be educated with an eye to the Constitution because it's from the household that future citizens will come. So the household is not a sort of apolitical arena. It is a, it's not directly a political space. It's not a space of citizenship, per se. But it is a space in which um, the politics reaches down, if you like. And Aristotle also says that the rule of a husband over a wife is a political form of rule. Now, he doesn't mean that a citizen form of rule, because citizen rule is characterised by alternating the rule between equals, whereas rule of husband over wife is permanent. But still, he can't treat her as a child or a slave or command her in that way. He has to command her in or rule her in a political way. But on the whole, he thought that women did not have the great gift of reason that certain men had, and that, that, that meant that they had to be eliminated from positions of authority. Yes, and the well, problem with the Spartan women is that they were licentious, bossy, guard of hand. Right. So let's leave them aside for the moment. Yeah. Let's, stick to, <laughs> let, let's stick to what he was saying, yes. who should rule. Let, then yes. we'll talk about the forms of rule, yes. who should rule, Yes, and well, why. Yes, yeah, so, so briefly on women. I mean, it's not that he feels that they don't have reason. He feels that their reason is not what he calls uh, kurion, so authoritative or dominant or sovereign within them. And it's for this reason that... They're too emotional. They like to be carried away by yeah. their passions um, and, uh, and therefore that they, they can't really be in a ruling position. But it's not that they have no reason. Mm. Um, and this is why you can rule them politically. So, yes, so um, Aristotle feels that citizenship should be limited to those who have this ruling, this reason, sort of reasoning faculty uh, dominant within, within them. And that means adult males because children only have it in, in sort of potentially. But that doesn't mean that that might expect us, uh, lead us to expect that citizenship should be for all adult male heads of household. But that's actually not the case. It may be that in some constitutions, citizenship is all free adult male heads of households. Um, but in other constitutions, it may not. So Aristotle tries to find a definition of citizenship, which is, if you like, politically neutral. What understanding of citizenship can we think of, which will cross both a democracy and an oligarchy, 
or any other kind of constitution. Can I just um, come in? Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. I just want to move on slightly. But we've got the women, they're out of ruling. Yes. So, sorry to be, appear to be rude here. But then we've got the slaves, a lot of slaves. Yes. Now, there are different sorts of slaves, and he thinks, uh, can you just give us uh, briefly the, the, his idea of slaves and why his particular idea of slaves and, and what their position was? Right. Because well, they're natural slaves, aren't they, as he yes. calls them? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, well... His main theoretical interest is in is in natural slaves. I mean, he uh, engages with the nature law debate with regard to slavery as well. Is it something that is by nature, or is it purely by convention or by law? And what Aristotle wants to establish is that there are something called slaves by nature, and these are people whom he sometimes seems to characterise as having no deliberative faculty at all. People who are not able actually to counsel themselves and therefore require to be directed by others. And he thinks that there are naturally such people um, who are, if you like, born to serve. Uh, and he makes them... And find fulfilment in that, he seems to find. Well, that's right. I mean, the slave cannot find... Happy... The natural slave cannot find happiness in the sense that the the master can, because the slave does not have this reason in the realisation of which human ha happiness and human flourishing consists. So to the extent that the slave has a good, it's realised by aiding and assisting in realising the master's good. And this is why uh, the slave is a tool or a part of the master. He doesn't have an independent good. But yes, insofar as the slave can flourish, uh, he flourishes uh, in the sense of being directed by a master. And Aristotle was, says that if these natural conditions between master and slave obtain, um, then there is a kind of friendship and, and mutual advantage going on in that, in that sort of pairing. So by that process of elimination, elimination, Angie Hobbs, what we end up with is the persons who we're going to now discuss as, as ruling the place in different sorts of constitutions are male, uh, educated, free, which means to a certain, uh, a certain extent wealthy. Uh, right. And then Aristotle, again, in these marvellous classifications comes in, he break, breaks down societies into three types, which have endured amazingly, haven't they? The monarchy, aristocracy and the polity. And in their corrupt forms, their tyranny, oligarchy and democracy. So can you address that for a few moments? Yes, I mean, again, he's bringing in his biological taxonomical training here and all the researches that his uh, assistants have, have done on all the various constitutions that Paul was talking about. He says there are two basic questions you need to ask, who rules and on whose behalf? And he says the three, if you answer those, you get three correct, as you said, the three correct constitutions of uh, monarchy, aristocracy and polity, where good people rule on the behalf of the state as a whole. These are good because the people are virtuous in each case. Indeed. Exactly. Educated and virtuous. They, absolutely. Yes. Um, and they also have, what we haven't touched on yet, they have to have sufficient leisure time mm. um, to be able to participate directly in the deliberative and judicial functions of the state and to acquire the necessary education in order to participate directly in an intelligent and reflective way. So so, ex exactly. But the leisure time actually implies wealth. And one of the interesting things when I was reading through this again is that, that he thought the corruption of uh, monarchy into, ty into tyranny and aristocracy into oligarchy was when wealth became more of a pursuit in the state than virtue, and that was a, the corrupting factor. I thought that was fascinating. It is, it is fascinating, yes, because uh, wealth must almost... Or, sorry, wealth must always uh, be seen solely as a, a means to an end. The end is always virtue. I mean... Well, the ultimate end of the state is to enable its citizens to flourish and to provide the good life for its citizens. But Aristotle argues uh, quite rapidly in the politics because he's building on arguments that he's developed at length in the Nicomachean Ethics. He argues that the good life must be the life of virtue. And as I said, in the Ethics, there are detailed arguments to try and make that identity that we cannot flourish unless we actualise all our faculties, including our moral and intellectual ones. Given Paul Cartledge that, that Aristotle is perched in the sort of fonds at origo of democracy there in Athens, democracy takes a bit of a beating, doesn't it? It does, but uh, Aristotle would say before you talk about democracy, let's talk about various kinds of democracy. This is his taxonomic self uh, operating again. And he subdivides democracy into four. And the worst, so in other words, the, the best might be actually quite close to the worst kind of oligarchy. So you, you get sort of um, lots of balances and checks, but... Uh, 
um, the worst kind of democracy. He never states this is what Athens actually has. There is another work, the one we mentioned, this Constitution of Athens, which does say that Athens is, of course, a democracy, and in Aristotle's time it gets more and more democratic, which has puzzled some of us uh, historians, but that's another issue. The last or the ultimate form of democracy, from what he says about it, looks most like the kind that Athens in his day had. And as you rightly say, he says some unflattering things about it, because what is particularly bad about it is when the people, demos means the people as a whole, or the mass of the ordinary, the poor people, they rule instead of the laws, uh, which I want to say unfair of Athens, because... The Athenians were extremely hot on the notion of rule of law, and they actually drew a distinction between a general law, which is permanent, which is never ad hominem, which is not the same as taking a decision on a particular occasion, on a particular issue, which was actually voted by a specially designated group of lawmakers. I mean, the Athenians in Aristotle's day were much actually more worried about illegality, unconstitutionality, than they had been in the 5th century, the century before. Angie. Yes, Paul, I wanted to ask you, would you agree that um, one of the reasons Aristotle portrays democracy in an unflattering light in the politics as one of the, of the corrupt constitutions is because he, he doesn't see it as the people governing for the good mm. of the people as a whole, but for the for the good so, of a particular sure. factional class interest, yeah. that it's very, very class-based and yeah. wealth-based. This is the poor people governing for the good of the poor people. Well, interestingly, his whole um, analysis, his anatomy of politics, is what we today would call a class-based uh, analysis. Because at one point he says famously that one could imagine a situation, theoretically, when the, where the majority are rich, theoretically, right? But it wouldn't be democracy, because they're rich, it would be an oligarchy, because what is the essential essence of oligarchy is wealth. What is the essential essence of democracy is poverty. And the two classes are, as it were, at each other's throat. And he wants a resolution. And Barbara? Yes, I wanted to say that one thing we haven't said about um, political rule is that it's vital to political rule that it's in the interest of the ruled. This is what distinguishes it from master-slave rule, which is in the interest of the ruler. So the slave, it's, it's rule, the slave may profit a bit, but it's basically for the interest of... Whereas con political rule is defined against master-slave rule. And the problem with uh, democracy, oligarchy and tyranny is that they are rules that are in the interest of the dominant group, i.e. either the poor or the rich or the tyrant. And this is what's corrupt about them, makes them uh, wrong forms of or deviated forms of constitution. So, so the corruption isn't so much in the idea of wealth. The corruption is in the idea of who is being served by the rulers. I, th I mean, on, on that, I, th I think what Paul was trying to say is that these two are related. Yeah, I think what Aristotle wants to say is that wherever the good or the cri that is sought by a constitution, whatever its, it, its ruling ethos and, and the basis on which it allows people to be citizens, wherever the criterion for citizenship is not virtue, there you have corruption, because virtue is the only thing which can act in the common interest of us all rather than subordinating others to our own good. Can I say that? Thing? Because actually what we've left out so far, and it's good to bring it in here, that the book previous to politics was his ethics, mm -hmm. and he took it for granted in these notes, because these were delivered as notes, these books, uh, 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 and can, came out as notes, that, that, that actually people had read ethics and knew about ethics, and the, the mm -hmm. virtuous life was the life to be sought for and lived, and virtue was the driving factor mm -hmm. in these states, and that was the, the, the high ambition mm -hmm. of, of any policy. Mm -hmm. Can you, before we move on, uh, uh, Annabelle, can you tell us... Uh, a little bit about the contrast between Aristotle and Plato. I don't know what to ask, isn't it, this time in the morning? Well, there you go. <laughs> um, um, I mean, uh, I mean he, Plato was his great got. teacher. <laughs> we have Socrates, yes. the great, you know, the great trinity, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Yes. Um, Aristotle, I understand, was much more of a pragmatist. Yes, yes. I mean, there are lots and lots of ways that you can handle the contrast between um, <laughs> Aristotle and Plato. I'm sure, and, but... Uh, um, but let, let, let's take the question of method. Um, and this question of the human good and how we find out the human good. So the, the ethics tells you what the human good is. It's the life of virtue, which is a life in accordance with reason, which is the faculty that distinguishes man from all the other animals and from natural slaves. Um, now, Plato had felt that... Plato, too, had thought that the city should be ruled in the light of the idea of the good. But the, for Plato, you couldn't... 
access to knowledge of what the good was and therefore practice of a good city wasn't available solely uh, sort of down here in this realm where we all operate. The philosopher, in order to know the good, has to kind of climb out of this cave of the city up to this ideal realm of forms, see them shining in the light of the good, ultimately see the good and then come back down into the cave armed with the knowledge of the good and craft a good city in the likeness of, of the forms. Whereas Aristotle felt that there is, there's no way of climbing out of this cave of the city to find out what the good is. We find out what the good is collectively here and now as part of a collective moral enterprise that we undertake with our fellow citizens. So it's always a situation specific. Mm. Um, and pragmatic compared to Plato, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you have to bear in mind particular circumstances. You know, Aristotle says in, in Book 4 of the Politics, you may not get the ideal. That doesn't mean that you should abandon politics forever. It's how can we approach what is good for us in these particular circumstances in which we are now. Paul there's, and Andrew. Yeah, there's a famous uh, fresco, which I always think of by um, Raphael, and it has Plato oh, and right. Aristotle next to each other. And it's probably very unfair, but nevertheless, Plato is pointing up to the heavens, and Aristotle sternly is not looking at Plato and pointing. That's the bottom line is the bottom line. So you start from what you know through sense perception, then you move up to the idea of theorization, and then possibly you can apply your theory. Uh, yes, I just I just wanted to add that it, it's always intrigued me that so many of uh, Aristotle's criticisms of uh, Plato and the politics are demonstrably unfair, <laughs> particularly of Plato's Republic. He's a bit more gentle on the laws. And yeah. I've never worked out whether Aristotle just hasn't bothered to check his facts in the Republic or whether he wasn't paying attention to Plato or whether he's just deliberately... Will Aristotle pay attention at the back? Of well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> because... For, I'm for, for, that, well, <laughs> for instance... For instance, for instance, um, you know, Aristotle criticises the community of wives and children of the two guardian classes in Plato's Republic, saying this is going to be a disaster, there's going to be unwitting patricide, there's going to be unwitting incest and so on. Now, in fact, Plato had foreseen those problems and had tried to... to uh, counter them in the proposals that he made and time and again Aristotle does this and one wonders if he's just doing what indeed Plato did with, with uh, political texts which is just use them entirely for his own ends and I should also add that uh, if, if um, anybody thinks that Aristotle is always the, the pragmatic, expedient, down to earth philosopher, they, they only need to go and read his metaphysics and his, his work on the soul and they'll We've see a much more imaginative dealing with politics, actually, Aristotle. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, I, I, I think that Aristotle that, that does say something very penetrating and really rather brilliant about Plato's Republic in, in Book Two of the Politics, which is that Plato's got the entire principle of the political wrong. For Plato, the ideal for the policy is to be as much one as possible, so it's unity. Whereas Aristotle says that unity destroys the polis. A polis is not about unity, it's about diversity in community. And this is precisely what constitutions are supposed to do, to accommodate plurality and diversity uh, in a kind of constructive way if they're a good constitution. I was oh. going to make different uh, sort of point pulling on from Angie that uh, Aristotle is also interested in something like utopianism of two kinds. One is a pragmatic kind. What is the best possible, given what we know about humans in society, in politics, how can we get as close to that? And he has his own version of a practical, he thinks, version. But he also has, and in this sense he is a pupil of Plato, um, he also has an ideal ideal, which is one goes beyond even what we've achieved so far, to, and then one of the things he does, this is what prompted this thought, he is keen on communal institutions, uh, including common meals. He just thinks that, for example, the Spartans have got the wrong way of doing it, but nevertheless the principle of actually eating together as a society. I mean, it's slightly impossible these days, but the notion is central to his notion of education. But I've leapt on there to the end of the politics. We've been looking so far at the first sort of third of the politics. There's then the middle section, which is all about this terrible strife, which I hinted at, and then he suggests how you can avoid strife or how you can heal strife. And then there's the final section on well, can utopia. We, can we dive into the, the section into how we've got who runs it? Mm. The the free, educated, leisure, available men. Uh, we've got the city state, and we've got the master slave. We've got we know where the women are. We we, we know that it's to do with the pursuit of virtue, which might yeah. seem impossibly high minded, but that's yeah. what it is to do with. Uh, and is uh, and is it over? Is it? And then we have to make it work. 
of yeah. the state through laws. Now, can we talk about what, how he wanted it to work, with yeah. you, starting with you, Paul? Well, different sorts. Remember I said different sorts of democracy, different sorts of um, oligarchy. And he does think that different societies have different tempers, so that whereas an extreme oligarchy might fit a particular society which has so many citizens and is on such and such terrain and has had such and such history, extreme democracy would fit another society, though he doesn't like either of those. I mean, what he likes is Aristotle being the philosopher of the, the golden mean, not too much of this and not too much of that. So whatever he thinks is very, very good is going to form either a balance or a mixture, and both those concepts were around from the late 5th century on, that the ideal society, pragmatically, not, not theoretically, but pragmatically, is a bit of oligarchy, a bit of democracy, a bit of monarchy, or a bit of um, not oligarchy, but aristocracy, to give it the nice uh, word. And uh, that's his notion of what he calls, confusingly, polity, which is the general word for citizenship. And so scholars, I mean, Angie will come in, Annabelle, what exactly Aristotle meant by that is, is a really interesting question, I think, but that's his pragmatic, realisable best state. Angie, then... Yes, Angie. I mean, Paul, he, he, always, he always makes it clear, doesn't he, that were there oh, a supremely virtuous individual ever to come oh, along, yeah. or a supremely virtuous group You're of right, individuals, right, right. then you could have a monarchy or an aristocracy which would be above the law. He says that quite clearly. Mm. But he says in the very likely absence of such a supremely <laughs> virtuous individual group, then we will need to go for polity. And the way he wants the polity to work in practice, isn't it, is by bringing in the middle class as mm. much as possible. Who are neither very, very rich he, nor very, exactly, very poor. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he, he, he thinks that you're going to have a more stable society which is going to um, get more general acceptance if you have a middle class, which, again, not too rich or too poor. He wants there to be laws which which limit excesses of wealth and poverty. Sure. He wants there to be state-controlled education so everybody mm. is educated for citizenship and people share practices and values. And that was odd and radical. Absolutely key. And but he thinks that a middle class are, are going to be... He thinks they'll be more rational and he thinks they'll be less prone to faction, perhaps optimistically. Annabelle Brown. Yeah, I mean, I think there there is a question, I mean, a problem about the virtue monarch in Aristotle, isn't it? Because Aristotle has seemed to co-define uh, the sphere of the political and the sphere of law. And in Book 5 of the Ethics, where he's, he's talking about citizen rule, which is this turn and turn about rule of equals, he associates that with, with rule by law. And with the virtue monarch, he seems to say, actually, we could have a political structure, because he's clear that uh, virtue monarchy is a political constitution that doesn't have the rule of law. And so scholars actually wonder whether, in allowing for the virtue monarch, this might be a kind of toadying up to Alexander. Um, here is where some, some contextual stuff about Alexander actually does come in, and that it's actually antithetical to the understanding of citizen rule and active citizen participation in rule, which he previously seems to have developed as part of the, the structure of the political per se. Mm. Andrew? That, that's all true, and, it, and it's so interesting, isn't it, that the Alexander is the sort of the eminence grise off stage throughout the politics. But there's also the point, it seems to me, that by stressing right from the beginning that humans flourish best in a polis, either a city-state or, as, as Paul has nicely put it, a citizen-state, um, that of, of an absolute, absolute limit of 100,000 people and mm. preferably less. 10, but there's citizens. also... Exactly. Yeah. There's also a, a covert criticism, isn't there, of everything that Alexander and his father Philip yeah. of Macedon were trying to do because they are precisely emasculating the city-states at this time and really reducing their power and the Alexander, the Macedonian Empire is really taking over. So there's also, I think, quite a, a firm criticism of, of a lot of Alexander's agenda yeah. going on. Two and things, can I just yeah, uh, can I come in here Paul, and ask you two things? First of all, just to make it clear that these, these ideas are being put forward at a time when when the civil strife, the civil wars, Alexander is tearing across Persia. Yeah. And so we're at a time of great turbulence. Yeah, and absolutely. so there's a sense of harking back to, the, to an idealised past. There is that sense inside the whole thing. Is that right? No, absolutely right. It's now, on the cusp. How, was he, how were his ideas received then? And how did, they, how did they push through in the next, say, just say a couple of centuries? Well, as you say, that? he founded a school 
which has a very, very long um, descendants. And um, it's called the Lyceum because it's named after a grove in Athens sacred to Apollo the wolf, wolfy Apollo, Lucaion, uh, Lycée in French today. But... Um, this was um, a sort of research centre, sort of like the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, I guess, and it attracted uh, extremely powerful people, typically from outside, not so much from Athens, and his successor was uh, a man called Theophrastus, and Theophrastus is best known to us for um, his characters, which were used by a famous playwright called Menander, a pupil of Theophrastus. So... Even immediately after Aristotle's own death, which was um, somewhat forced upon him, he um, had established a very firm foundation of a, a school which would have descendants. And I hand over to my more expert colleagues on what precise forms the descent took. They're looking they're rather abashed at this. Uh, <laughs> but let me do it and put you sure, in the clear sure. on that. Let me ask them. <laughs> Angie. With pleasure. Because <laughs> they, they ran for a while, as Paul has indicated, and then the, the, almost more interesting is that the Roman, they're scarcely mentioned in Roman times, so century after century after century, in about the 8th or 9th century, Aristotle is not in, sorry about this phrase, he's not in the frame, is he? He's not a reference, he's not used there. That's, that is, well, that's right. I mean, there's a wonderful the academy, yeah. there's a wonderful story, which I hope is true. It probably isn't that most of Aristotle's uh, texts really were sort of they were lost. They were in a wine barrel and somewhere Very in the Troad yeah. or something. They they really went kind of missing until the first century BC when there was an edition by Andronicus of well, Rhodes. That's one version. Another is that they were available to the library at uh, Alexandria. Yes, and indeed, like to get into AD in this. Okay, discussion. We'll, we'll, <laughs> sh- we'll shoot on into AD. Yes. Um, and uh, <coughs> then we start by yes. It doesn't by... really. It doesn't really emerge. Sorry about this. This is crude, but this yeah. is one of my jobs. It doesn't really emerge the eighth and ninth century in the great Arabic translation movement that turned from that they turned into Arabic, and then a couple of centuries later they're translated into Latin, and they reach Thomas Aquinas, the sort of pivotal uh, theolog- theologian but also philosopher of the early Middle Ages, Annabelle, and he absorbs Aristotle. He somehow makes an equation between Aristotle, Aristotelianism and Christianity, and from then on Aristotle uh, is a great striding figure through the next centuries. Is that more or less right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the, the, the politics is um, tra- tra- finally translated into Latin really just before Aquinas writes his major work, The Summa, with its uh, thesis of, of man governed by natural law. So what basically Aquinas does is to take this Aristotelian thesis of the good as the end, this teleology of the good, and implant it into a Christian framework of eschatology, a final end governed by God. And so what he does is to to take this this idea that we are directed by reason and can direct ourselves by reason um, and implant that into a universe which is directed by a rational God to its ultimate end. So he finds a space for the Aristotelian political within the Christian structure of a human life that goes beyond the political to our ultimate home, uh, which is with God. Um, so it's, it's because of this, this teleological sense that he finds in Aristotle, this movement towards the good, that the human city can have a place en route to our final good, which is, which is God. Do you, Paul Hartley, did you see him as a, from then on, from the early Middle Ages into the Renaissance, as being a dominating figure, a figure, sorry, dominating figure in the history of philosophy? Well, yes and no. I mean, because also there's a Neoplatonic um, yeah. tradition that's um, running alongside, and Aristotle's inheritance is, of course, Platonic. But um, this is an issue which um, surfaces again, more particularly in the Renaissance, which again I hand over to my um, expert colleagues on my left. Well, I mean, he certainly influenced Machiavelli, which might surprise us because Machiavelli is not uh, telling his uh, prince how to be virtuous, but he's telling him how to keep his... Keep power. Keep power, keep yeah. power. But what so interested Machiavelli, and we know this from his discourses on Livy, is all the advice that Aristotle gives in uh, book uh, five and book six of, of the politics on how to maintain mm. power in constitutions and how to maintain the stability of constitutions. And Aristotle even gives the tyrant some advice on how to maintain power. Now, 
why Aristotle is doing this is for a different reason from, from Machiavelli. Aristotle, I think, is hoping to push the tyrant a little more in the direction of rational, virtuous kingship and also maybe saying, if you know the tyrant's tactics, that's a good insurance policy against his ever emerging in your state. But Machiavelli th- sees all these rules for maintaining your power as a tyrant and thinks, wow, great, and, so, and, and, and definitely takes some of those on. And then, of course, when, when we get to Thomas Hobbes, um, again, who's quite critical of Aristotle and the mm. schoolmen in several ways, but uh, we get the whole debate about whether the, the state is natural or not. And, of mm. course, Hobbes takes a very different line from Aristotle. Hobbes also thinks the state is wonderful, but not because it's natural, but precisely because it's unnatural and a cure for nature. Paul, can I yeah. ask you, do you think that the society as proposed by the goods, the societies as proposed by Aristotle are in any way attractive or viable? Are we talking about authoritarian societies, really? Well, by our standards, all ancient Greek communities would have been thought unacceptably um, directive because they did have a notion of what the, the human and the social and the political good were, and they weren't afraid to enforce it through their laws. And partly the history of liberalism, that is the distinction between what a state which could have threatening powers over individuals. That division opens up from the Renaissance on, whereas the ancient Greeks tended to think that individuals were secondary, that no matter how powerful, in a way, the community was more important. And therefore, that sort of um, dichotomy today of private virtue as opposed to public virtue was very much underemphasized and it was potentially uh, negative in antiquity today it's very positive we should do our own thing up to a point but one of aristotle's criticisms of extreme democracy is that precisely in an extreme democracy people do what they want they live as they like it's actually an unfair criticism but nevertheless it implies the the norm which is that the community comes first and you must abide by its general rules. Because they had a lot, there were laws about everything. I mean, yeah. playing the flute was bad. Absolutely, there were laws about absolutely. what sort of sex you should yeah. have and when, yeah. uh, and yeah. so on and so forth. But I think it's really important to Aristotle's politics that he insists that being co-citizens together is not simply a matter of mutually being under one law that protects us from injustices from each other. He says that's to make the state into what he calls a defensive alliance, mm. which maybe protects us from injustice but can't make us virtuous, isn't concerned with human flourishing. So... Um, I mean, I think what's, what, what's interesting today is this very active notion of citizenship, citizenship that he has as participation in rule and that mutual participation in political deliberation as part of our virtuous life and how, part of how we find out what the human good is. So it's a much more active notion of citizenship. And you? Well, and I'd like... Now, I'm, I'm afraid I have to ask a final question. But do you, do you think... That you, can you see his influence in political philosophy or in states now? I'm afraid you've got yeah. 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all the all the discussion at the moment about training for citizenship. He thinks that we need to educate people to be citizens. Um, the debate at the moment about whether we're giving our children and indeed our working adults enough uh, active, intelligent leisure time in order to fully develop our human faculties and capacities. The debate over whether there should be curbs on excesses of wealth and poverty. Absolutely yes. Well, thank you very much, Angie Hobbs, Annabel Brett and Paul Cartledge. And next week we'll be talking about recent developments in neuroscience. Neuroscience, goodness me. Good morning. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.